Welcome to the 700 Club, and thanks so much for joining with us. Well, according to the IDF, there's no safe place for terrorists in Gaza. Israel is now moving forward with its plan to invade Rafah. And that's despite pressure from the United States. Israeli leaders say they won't stop until Hamas is destroyed. Thousands of Christians are rushing to Israel to help in its hour of need. One evangelical supporter of the Jewish state has a strong warning for U.S. policymakers. Paul Strand reports from Jerusalem. Despite U.S. opposition, Israel is going forward with plans for a military operation against Rafah, the last Hamas stronghold in Gaza. There is no safe place for terrorists in Gaza. Even those who may think that we are delayed will soon see that we can reach any place. We will eliminate Hamas. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is pressuring Israel to alter its war aims and make guarding the lives of civilians in Gaza its top mission. Protecting civilians, getting people the assistance they need. That has to be job number one. Israel's military says it's creating humanitarian islands in the middle of Gaza where displaced Palestinians can go for refuge. Israel and the U.S. are also working on a new maritime corridor allowing massive amounts of aid to go straight from the sea to Gaza's starving civilians, bypassing Hamas and criminal gangs who've hijacked much of the aid brought over land. This corridor will uh, enable the distribution of up to two million meals every single day. As Israel faces growing international pressure, evangelical Christians are some of its strongest supporters. Some see American support for Israel as part of America's purpose. Tony Perkins heads up an evangelical think tank in Washington. I think America's future is intertwined with Israel's future. Uh, when you look at where America has gone in the last 60 years, as, we, as we've moved away from the Word of God, the ways of God, you know, I think the only reason that God has sustained America is because of our stand with Israel, that we've been a bulwark for, uh, for, for this land we're standing on. Christians are also showing their support for the Jewish state in very practical ways. With many young Israelis called to the front lines, pro-Israel Christians from around the world are showing up to pick the crops and do other jobs those Israelis had to leave behind. It's an honor to uh, serve this land and to be near you, to cry with you, to pray with you. No matter how many nations turn against Israel over the war, these Christians say they won't. I know the whole world hates Israel. And I want to say, and we want to say as a group, we love Israel and we stand behind you. I stand here with all my faith in the God of Israel. War worries have slashed the number of daily visitors to Israel from 15,000 to just 3,000. And these faith-based volunteers make up as many as one half of those visitors. Paul Strand, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, Israel definitely needs help. They need help just with the basics of picking their crops. The uh, orange field uh, trees, the lemon trees are all going to waste because the people who normally tend that harvest are fighting in Gaza. They, they've had a massive mobilization. Uh, so let's pray for the peace of Israel. Let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's been one of the great mysteries to me how our foreign policy experts would somehow side with a terror group called Hamas. And in calling it a terror group, let's also recognize it is the government of Gaza. They were elected to, to govern Gaza. Right after they were elected, they suspended all elections for the future, and they absolutely solidified their hold on power, and it's a Hamas dictatorship right now. Uh, they are persecuting the Palestinian people. Our foreign policy efforts should be solely aimed at how do we get Hamas out of power, how, to make, how do we make sure they can never strike again, they can never have weapons again, how do we cut off all sources of funds to them, how do we... Um, uh, any country, any UN organization, anybody that is supplying money or su anything to them, that needs to stop, and it needs to stop today. Hamas has to end. In other news, while the world watches the conflicts in the Middle East and Europe, trouble is brewing in another part of the globe, and that's the Korean Peninsula. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Gordon. The United States and South Korean militaries are wrapping up large-scale war games this week. 
As CBN's Dale Hurd reports, this comes amid heightened concerns over the threat of conflict with a nuclear-armed North Korea. Is North Korean leader Kim Jong-un about to go to war with South Korea and the United States? Some experts think it's possible. Kim has ordered his military to prepare for the occupation of South Korea and is, according to some, engaged in frantic military development. And after South Korea and the United States began the Freedom Shield 24 exercises designed to deter a North Korean invasion, it only caused Kim to issue more threats of war. The task of North Korean experts has always been to try to separate bluster from real threats. And in the past, it's usually been bluster. Bong Young Shik at the Institute for North Korean Studies in Seoul says it's bluster, meant to undermine the current South Korean government from winning parliamentary elections in April. A disturbing report earlier this year by the respected 38 North website, however, indicates this time Kim may be serious. 38 North reports Kim Jong un has made a strategic decision to go to war because the communist government sees a window of opportunity to forcibly reunify the Korean peninsula. If the report is true, Asian expert Gordon Chang believes it would be part of a wider Asian war. North Korea wouldn't go to war unless it got the approval of both Moscow and Beijing. So probably um, if North Korea were to attack South Korea, it would be in conjunction with China attacking Japan, Taiwan, Philippines, India. Concerns about North Korea's nuclear program have grown in the past two years, as the North has test-launched missiles at a record pace and openly threatened to launch a nuclear attack on the United States. Chang does not necessarily agree that North Korea is preparing for war, but says if it is, the blame falls on the White House for appearing weak. An important part of this article that I believe is absolutely true, and that is uh, the authors maintain that Kim Jong-un believes that the United States is in global retreat and that essentially he can pretty much do what he wants. That is a very dangerous mentality. And this is a thinking that also affects Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. The United States needs to reestablish deterrence because at this moment, uh, the bad actors think that they have a green light. Kim Jong-un did something very strange a few weeks ago. While touring North Korea's impoverished countryside, he said publicly he's ashamed and sorry for neglecting the economy. It was very uncharacteristic of a leader with a reputation for being ruthless. It could mean Kim finally has a heart, or it could mean he knows a stronger economy will be needed if he's going to fight a war. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thank you, Dale. Well, here at home, a judge dismissed several charges against former President Donald Trump in the case over alleged efforts to overturn Georgia's 2020 election results. Fulton County Superior Judge Scott McAfee dropped three charges against Mr. Trump and three against his attorney, Rudy Giuliani. They relate to alleged efforts to pressure state officials to change election results. The judge said prosecutors failed to give enough detail to substantiate the charges but could appeal the ruling. Trump still faces 10 counts, including racketeering and filing false documents. The judge will also decide this week if the prosecutor in the case, Fonnie Willis, should be removed over claims that she improperly hired a man she had a romantic relationship with to lead the events investigation, as well as taking vacations together at his expense. Well, here in Washington, TikTok users are speaking out against the House after passing a bill that could block the social media app here in America. Lawmakers and intelligence officials say Chinese-owned TikTok could be used to mani manipulate elections and the American people. CBN's Charlene Aaron reports. Members of Congress are being flooded with calls from angry constituents after passing the bill that could see TikTok banned. Lawmakers and intelligence officials say TikTok poses serious national security risks. The bill is passed. The House overwhelmingly passed the bill Wednesday, giving TikTok's Chinese owner, ByteDance, six months to sell the app or see it blocked from app stores in America. This bill therefore forces TikTok to break up with the Chinese Communist Party. Intelligence officials argue that TikTok poses a national security threat and that the Chinese government could demand access of TikTok's 170 million American users. 
They also argue that manipulation of algorithms, especially ahead of the November election, is cause for concern. RISC's FBI Director Chris Wray recently confirmed in testimony before Congress this week. And if they went to him and said, we want you to change your algorithm so that Americans start seeing videos that hurt this candidate or help that candidate in the upcoming election, Biden would have to do that under Chinese law. That's my understanding. And if they said, we want you to put out videos that make Americans fight with each other or spread conspiracy theories and get them at each other's throat, ByteDance doesn't have, can't go to Chinese court and fight the Communist Party. They would have to do it. That's my understanding. Former President Trump, who once supported banning the app, has flipped his stance, citing it would give other social media companies like Facebook more power. In a letter to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Trump's former Vice President Mike Pence encouraged lawmakers to pass the bill, saying there can be no doubt that this app is Chinese spyware and that a sale to a non-foreign adversary company is in the best interests of the American people. TikTok says it never shared its information with the Chinese government. Users say a ban would impact small businesses who rely on the platform for marketing and selling products. My whole business would be devastated. Yeah, I would lose the opportunity to connect with millions of people on a regular basis, and the community that I've worked really hard to build would be, would be gone. The bill now heads to the U.S. Senate, where its passage is uncertain. President Biden says he will sign it into law if it reaches his desk. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Opinions across the board. Thank you, Charlene. Gordon, back to you. Well, here's something that uh, Representative Dan Crench Crenshaw has, has pointed out. Uh, ByteDance owns TikTok. ByteDance is now owned by the CCP. It's owned by the Communist Party. There's a law in China that if the CCP demands information from a company they own, they have to provide it. And in that provision, they can't report to anyone that they have provided the data. So when TikTok says we've never given the data to the Chinese government, well, they may not know. Uh, they have given it to ByteDance. And so if ByteDance has, is under this law, who would ever know if it went to the Chinese government? So th this is something from a, yes, from a national security standpoint, you have this many Americans um, paying this much attention to a social media app, and could the algorithms be rigged? Could the content be rigged? Could, could content be deleted? Could content be censored? All of those things are possible because it's a private company and our Constitution doesn't apply to it. You add to it that the Communist Party is in charge of it, well, then that's a recipe for disaster. Well, if you watch the news, you've seen the videos. Mobs of people breaking into stores, smashing displays, filling bags with loot. A surge in retail crime has cities across America scrambling to find solutions. CBN's Tara Mergener is in Washington with more. The nation's capital and other big cities see this as a major crime problem. Shoplifting has exploded into large-scale theft, and the often resulting violence is keeping customers away. In the end, it's consumers left holding the bag as prices skyrocket and many stores set up shop somewhere else. You've seen the videos. You can see right there just clearing the shelves. From brazen shoplifters to smash and grab mobs, the images are sweeping the internet. Never before have we seen the number of CEOs, executives, and even community leaders reach out and highlight the dangers that are taking place in the retail industry. While shoplifting remains a major challenge, a new phenomenon is hitting so-called brick-and-mortar stores. About 90% of our organized retail crime cases involve some type of online selling platform. Homeland Security believes that's due to organized criminal gangs with ties to drug trafficking, who steal the merchandise, then sell it online. There are crime syndicates that could be tied to local gang networks that maybe have established uh, networks either from the Chilean or Colombian threats or Romanian crews coming in from Eastern European that are comfortable in certain cities. Stores are losing big money, raising prices to cover it, and the greatest cost could be to the safety of workers. Whether gangs or individuals, 90% of retailers say thieves are much more aggressive now compared to a year ago. They're getting more comfortable with it because they know that 
we're not allowed to, that we won't chase after them. Violent incidents alone are up by more than a third. As a result, stores are cutting hours, adding security and keeping products under lock and key. You go to a CVS, in New York City, everything's locked up. Good, good luck getting in toothpaste. CVS is among those closing key locations like this one in Washington, D.C., where thieves recently carried out merchandise in giant trash bags. 52 restaurants to close their doors in Washington, D.C. this year. The cycle is also affecting eating establishments, with dozens recently closing their doors, citing safety concerns. Mark police cruisers getting carjacked. Um, uh, ambulances. Uh, we had an American Red Cross van that was supposed to feed uh, the homeless the other day get carjacked. After years of what critics call soft on crime laws, the Justice Department now plans to deploy resources hoping to reverse the trend. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser wants council members to pass new legislation. And give law enforcement more tools to hold criminals accountable and keep our neighborhoods safe. As communities seek solutions, huge financial losses continue to mount. Nationwide, the latest National Retail Federation survey shows more than $100 billion in losses in 2023, $20 billion more than the year before. Still, despite the numbers and viral videos, some industry observers insist there's little data to back up claims retail crime alone is to blame. I don't think we can reliably say if stores had been reliably reporting it over decades, we could follow the trends. A store can change its policies and all of a sudden you get a whole bunch more or they could change their policies back and all of a sudden it drops. Um, so I'm kind of suspicious. There is macroeconomic factors, there is regulatory factors, there is company strategic decisions as well that's all playing a role. Experts agree American retailers are more vulnerable, with growing numbers unwilling to become the next target. The cost of organized retail crime and shoplifting is soon expected to top $140 billion, with consumers ultimately footing the bill to the tune of $500 per person every year. In Washington, I'm Tara Mergener, CBN News. Well, Tara took it all the way down to you because that's where it goes. You look at this and, you know, what happens after one, a theft and, and a theft of this magnitude at a retail establishment? Well, that company is going to file an insurance claim. They have insurance for theft. As the claims rise, what does that mean? Well, it means the insurance company has to increase their premiums. Who's going to pay that? Well, you and I as consumers, uh, it's, it's, on, it's on us. So whatever's happened in our society where suddenly we're, we're not tough on crime, we're soft on crime, um, and these criminals can say, well, we can go do it, we can smash and grab, and we can get out the door, and nobody's going to follow us, and, and we get to go enjoy uh, the fruit of our stealing, uh, and nobody's going to do anything. Uh, I, I remember in Virginia, uh, shoplifting was a felony. And, it, and you had to deal with store security and they were absolutely going to monitor you and all of these things. And uh, you, you, you look at that and what, what, have, what have we come to? There's another problem and that is our prisons are overfilled. Yes. And so if we get tough on this, what's that going to do to the prison population? So where does it all go to? It all goes to we've turned our back on God. These people are doing it in, in the open. There's no fear of God in anything that they're doing here. Uh, and with that, we're, we're losing our integrity as a culture. And Jesus warned that lawlessness was going to increase. We're seeing it, and, and it can get really bad. When that happens, we have to watch as Christians, will our love grow cold? Will we look at this and instead of having compassion, how do we find solutions? How do we preach the gospel with even more fervor? How do we say, you are obviously lost, you're obviously hurting, you need to have a savior, and uh, here's something that can happen to you that will completely change your life, and you won't want to do this anymore. Now more than ever, let's preach the gospel because the world is really hurting. Terry? 
Longtime viewers of ESPN know that the network boasts no shortage of talking heads and hot debates. Yet there was one viewpoint they wouldn't tolerate on their airwaves. Conservative Christian beliefs voiced by Sports Center anchor Sage Steele. Will Dawson brings us her story. I am the poster child for what happens when you are true to yourself at times. And you know what? I'm okay with it now. Sage Steele is one of the most respected broadcasters in sports. On August 14th, 2023, she walked away from a 16-year career at ESPN. More on that soon. For Sage, sports isn't just a career, it's a way of life. Tell me about this one, you and your dad golfing. You know, I am i don't know how I'm not an incredible golfer after this setup. <laughs> this is in Monterey, California. He, I mean, he always was so athletic. And I remember him exercising and staying super active, and that's why us kids are as well. But I love this. I'm so focused. And I, I did. I always wanted him, you know. You wanted his support. Oh, my gosh, and I got it. Gary Steele was a legendary two-sport athlete at West Point, starring in track and field and football, where he became the first African-American to play for the Black Knights. His daughter is as impressed with his humility as his athletic accolades. I learned about how he was recruited and how he was choosing in the, in the mid-60s between West Point, which was in its heyday back then, and Penn State and Joe Paterno. And I was like, Joe Paterno recruited you, Dad? And he was like, Ugh. Like, I'm, I, you know, I've wanted to be a sportscaster since I was a little kid. Why haven't you told me these things about, about you? And he just never wanted it to be about him. As a pioneer, Gary is familiar with racism. However, none was as personal as the rejection from his future in-laws. My parents have been married for 52 years. But when I think about how it began, and how my mother in particular had to choose between the man she loved and her family. So her strength I'm in awe of, and that is why when I have my stuff, <laughs> I think back to that and to my parents and the love that they have, obviously, um, from day one. And that's strength mm -hmm. and that's toughness. Sage's army brat upbringing afforded her a unique and broad view on life. It must give you a very interesting perspective on race, culture, and people. Yes, yes, black, white, Asian, it, it didn't matter. It was a beautiful upbringing. In 1995, she graduated from Indiana University and began a sports broadcasting career in various markets around the country. Sage Steele, disturbing news out of... We see a lot of women in sports broadcasting now, but when you started, you were on the, the front end of that. So being different made me good at that very early in my career. Um, and so I'm very grateful for being uncomfortable because it made me, it made me better at, at my job. And I think in hindsight that they saw that I did my homework and came prepared with thoughtful questions. In 2007, Sage was hired by ESPN and quickly became a prominent figure in sports broadcasting, hosting ESPN's flagship show, SportsCenter. In 2021, Sage appeared on a podcast and expressed conservative opinions on a variety of topics, including the COVID vaccine, sexuality, and race. She was promptly suspended by ESPN. How disappointed were you or heartbroken were you then when you found out that you had been suspended? It's devastated. I felt like I'd, um, I had disappointed people just by being me, though. During her suspension, Sage contracted a bad case of COVID. And I got up to take a quick shower and go to the, it says like three in the morning and I, I fell over. And I realized that if I fall over in the shower and hit my head, um, no one will find me because I was alone. And so I just got back in bed and I just prayed that I'd wake up and that my heart would stop racing. I'll just never forget that time being stuck in bed um, and reading some of the things that were being said and never feeling so alone in my life, ever. I woke up the next day, thank God, and just was like, uh, 
at that point trying to stay off my phone because uh, the hate was pretty real, the negativity. The negativity she received online was in the form of threats to her life and to her family. I'll be honest and say that it hit me quite hard and there were times when I was in tears over what was said. When there were death threats, when people threatened to rape my daughters, but my faith had got me through the prior couple of years and um, I knew that because I woke up that morning, God had a plan for me. Uh, so that helped me uh, just keep pushing. In Matthew 5:44, Jesus talks about praying for your enemies and forgiving those who persecute you. Mm. You have some bracelets on your wrists that talk about grace. I really do try to pray for um, those who have not been so nice. The word grace has been everything to me. I can look down at these bracelets and I get, I get this piece about me and I'll just touch it real quick. And I literally know that I'm not alone. God has proven that to me a million times over, even when I wasn't paying attention. Um, but I know he has been with me throughout this entire process. Sage's two-year legal battle with ESPN ended in August. She says her future is in God's hands and is telling her story in hopes of helping others. All I've ever wanted is conversation. I love to talk way too much. <laughs> and I, I just, I've enjoyed that. To me, that's why, um, I've loved this profession is to be able to talk and to get to know people. Sage, when I talk to you, what I see is a very relatable person who is just like me or just like anybody else who has been prepared in various steps throughout yeah. her life for this. Yeah, everybody's got something. And despite the facades that sometimes we intentionally put out there or inadvertently, everybody is a human being first with pain and struggles. Um, and I want, I, I want to share mine in hopes that will make others feel more comfortable sharing theirs. So alone, feeling in the midst of something like that. And, um, you know, it's, it's like that when you stand up for who you are, for what you believe, sometimes for righteousness. You may be the only voice in the room. And the persecution that follows can be intense. Boy, her faith... Her faith was the thing that allowed her to survive. Her yep. mm -hmm. What an incredible talent and, wow. and what an incredible personality. Yes. And you see the faith coming through yeah. that, yes, no matter what, I'm going to continue to follow follow mm -hmm. God. I'm going to do it his way. Absolutely. And there is a cost to it, um, the, the cost of discipleship, but the cost of also standing for what you believe in our current yeah. culture. Uh, there's so many pressures, particularly for anyone in media, uh, to tamp down the message or to say, well, uh, I'm not going to read that part of the Bible. Um, no, we've got to stay true. A message that used to be so common right. in our country. I mean, And so accepted. Yes, yes, ri ridiculous, really. Right. But yeah. I'll go back that the world needs the message. Amen. <laughs> keep, <laughs> and keep they, they need to know that there's a God who loves them that's willing to forgive yeah. them and set them free and put them on a path. Amen. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Thousands of Americans, including some missionaries, are trapped in Haiti as the nation's political and social crisis spirals out of control. The United States sent a team of Marines into Port-au-Prince to enhance embassy protection. Gang violence has rocked the country, forcing the prime minister to pledge to resign. The U.S. and Caribbean leaders are working to help create a transitional government, but a powerful gang leader reportedly is against the deal. The U.N. is evacuating personnel. Meanwhile, Americans there are hoping the U.S. government will take action to help them leave. Well, an important development for the hit series, The Chosen, about the life and ministry of Jesus and his disciples. The creator and director of the series, Dallas Jenkins, announcing online that season four of the series will not come to streaming as soon as planned for financial and legal reasons. Jenkins explained the economic details of producing and releasing The Chosen and the team's goals for the future, saying he wants to make sure the show remains free forever and is available to more than a billion people. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. 
Araceli is a single mom raising three children. That's a hard job under normal circumstances. It's even harder for her because she has no one to look after her kids while she's working. After her husband abandoned them, Araceli has been working on farms in San Quentin, Mexico to support her three young children. I was very worried. I had to pay rent and buy food for them. The children used to cry a lot, and I think it's because they were hungry. There were days when we didn't have anything to eat. The situation got worse when Araceli no longer had anyone to help her take care of the kids while she went to work. I cried when that happened. I saw my children suffering because there was no money for food. Then one day, Araceli connected with a daycare facility supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. She told us why she'd never gone there in the past. I thought I had to pay for childcare there, but when I went, I learned that it was free. I saw the place. It's big. I thought my children would have a lot of space to run and play here. Now the children have a safe place to stay while their mom is at work. And there's another huge bonus. The program provides daily nutritious meals and snacks. Araceli's four-year-old son thinks that's great. I feel peace when I live them here. I go to work calmly. There's been a change in our lives, a total change. For me, this is a great blessing. Thank you. There has been a change in our lives, a total change. That is the hallmark of the work that you are doing around the world, CBN friends. If you've joined the 700 Club, you're responsible for making a difference in the lives of people like that. What a privilege we have to step right into the need of a young mom with three kids who doesn't want anything negative to happen to her kids. She's just trying to keep all the, the plates up in the air, all the children fed, keep everybody housed and clothed, and you came right into the middle of that and made a difference. Thank you. You know, you can be such a change in the world. You can offer such change. You can make such a difference. And one of the ways you can do that is by joining the 700 Club. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. That makes you a 700 Club partner. But let me show you the options that you have because maybe you already are a 700 Club partner. Would you consider going up to 700 Club Gold? That's a gift of $40 a month. You could become a 1,000 Club member at $84 a month or join us at our 2500 club level that's $209 a month and then our founders join us 417 a month that works out to $5,000 a year what an opportunity we have what a privilege and what a responsibility when God has blessed us so will you become a part of what we're doing around the world the numbers toll free to call it's 1-800-700-7000 <clears throat> excuse me you just call and say I want to join the 700 club by the way when you do we're going to say thank you to you by sending you Gordon's teaching on how to believe for healing and it comes with this handbook journal to help reinforce the truths of all of that from scripture in your own life we want you to have this and most of all we want you to link arms with us to touch the world with the love of Jesus. Call us now won't you please Gordon? Well as a teenager Humis ate, breathed, slept baseball. Then he blew his scholarship offers by drug and alcohol abuse and over time he shook his addiction to drugs but he couldn't kick alcohol until one night in a dream he wrestled with the father he had never forgiven. I felt very bad. I felt like I was a horrible Christian. God doesn't really love me that much because I must be one of his bad sons. It had been eight years since Hermes Giannis gave his life to Christ. Now at age 30, he just received a DUI and an ultimatum from his wife, Joanna. He said, you keep this cycle up and we're gonna have to get a divorce. You have an addiction to alcohol. You really need help. And I was in there now. I didn't want to really admit that I can't stop. It was crushing. Hermes' path to finding purpose and faith in Christ had started when he was young. Raised by a single mother, he would decided early on that his ticket to success was baseball. By the end of his freshman year, three colleges had offered him scholarships. I lived, breathed, slept, baseball. That was my identity right there. I became very arrogant. I became cocky. 
I was a ninth grader thinking I ran the world. You know, I was like, I got this. Now, Hermes was hanging out with his older teammates, smoking pot daily and sneaking into bars. His grades dropped, and in his junior year, Hermes was cut from the team. Any shot he had at a college scholarship was gone. It's like my world stopped. It completely froze. So now I was shameful. So even when I would brush my teeth in the mornings, I remember I would look at myself, I always used to curse at myself. Just spit toothpaste to the mirror, like, I, I can't believe you, you know? Almost overnight, Hermes became an alcoholic. I would bring a water bottle with me, and people would think it's water, and I'll have vodka in there. And just drinking it like it was normal. I was literally drinking my life away. I was committing suicide slowly. Then one night, drunk, high, and on his way home from a club, Hermes was in a terrible car accident. He woke up in an ambulance with a paramedic looking over him. And he goes like this to me, I'm a Christian man and God saved your life. Nobody usually um, survives an accident like this. I just kind of brushed it off. I just didn't understand that God would save me, you know, that, that there's somebody out there that loves me. I didn't feel loved. Hermes kept up his party lifestyle. A few years later, a friend insisted that he go to church with her. I heard who Jesus is. I started hearing about my sin problem. I had no idea what sin was, but it hit me. It started touching me. What hit him harder was what the pastor said at the end of his sermon. A young man in here, he's in this building right now, and you've been going through this and this, and everything he was saying was exactly what I've been through in the past four years. There has to be another kid in here. That can't be me. He's like, young man, if that's you, don't leave this place without giving your life to Jesus. And it hit me. And I broke down like a baby right there. I surrendered my life to Jesus. I said, Jesus, I don't know who you are, but I asked for you to come into my life. Even then, he wasn't convinced Jesus was who he said he was. So a few days later, while struggling with pain from an old back injury, Hermes decided to test him. And I said, Jesus, if you're real, you come and you heal my back. And it was just me on my knees, and I'll never forget this moment. It felt like the whole atmosphere around me just changed instantly. And I felt like this heat around my back from head, from the whole spinal, it was like a heat that went up and down. And I knew something was there. I knew it was God. I've never had back pain ever again in my entire life. And I knew that it was Jesus Christ who healed my back. I knew it was him. From that point forward, I was convinced. Hermes says Jesus also set him free from drug addiction. He dove into his new faith wholeheartedly. Found myself a mentor. He started teaching me the word of God. I got me a Bible, so I started reading the gospel, growing in the knowledge of Christ. I started understanding, you know, that I'm a sinner, that I need forgiveness. Soon after, he met Joanna and they married and started a family. Although growing in his relationship with God, he still struggled with alcohol. I would fall into addiction every time a situation would happen to me, you know, because there was still a uh, pain in me that I wasn't really dealing with. That pain stemmed from his childhood and the father he never knew. That wound of anger and hatred that I had towards my father was just getting deeper and deeper as the years went by, you know. I hated him even as a Christian. I was like, I don't want to forgive that man. He doesn't deserve it. You know, so I was struggling with that. Then came the DUI, his wife's threat of divorce, and a few nights later, a dream where he was wrestling with a man he knew was his father. And it showed me in the dream how I had to, and I must forgive him. I must release him and let him go, and that God loves him. And I know that was the root of everything right there. For that, Hermes needed God's help. I was challenged to forgive him through prayer every single day, you know, and God would pour into me his love and help me feel what God felt for my father. And when I would pray for him, I started feeling compassion for him. I started forgiving him, and this took a while, it took months, but that was my freedom. Hermes has been sober since 2019. He and Joanna have a beautiful marriage, and their family is thriving. He's now a pastor at a Christian recovery center for men called The Caring Place. There's a God out there who really truly cares about every single detail of your life. Now it's like I eat, sleep, live, breathe, Jesus. Like, that's it. I'm sold out. And he loves me 
with an unconditional love. There's nothing better. And he loves you with an unconditional love. His love is for everyone. You can be a whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You can have that. What you just saw, that transformation, you can have it. Maybe his story is like your story. Something happened, you grew up hard, uh, you were physically abused. Uh, the, maybe you were sexually abused. Uh, maybe you were bullied, tormented. All of these things left an indelible mark. And, and you constantly get into situations where that thing triggers you, and it triggers you into bad behavior. Now, for Hermes, it started out with, well, I want to hang out with the older guys on the, on the baseball team. So here I am in ninth grade, and the older guys, they're doing these things, and so I want to be like them. So I'm going to start doing that. And, and before long, the, the old adage, first you take the drug and then the, ta the drug takes you, well, that happened to him. And by his junior year, he was kicked off the team because his grades didn't make it anymore. And it shattered him. He had this view of himself and what he wanted to do in life, and now he couldn't achieve that. Well, then he saw the story. He heard a message. And in that message, the pastor said, you shouldn't live, leave until you give your heart to Jesus Christ. And so he did that. He did that. Then he had a challenge prayer. You know, Lord, if you're there, could you heal my back? And then he said, from that point forward, I was all in. But Christianity, working out your salvation, can sometimes be a long process because you want to hold certain things. For him, it was anger against his father. And that was all alcohol needed to do to get a hold of him. He just had to have something trigger that. And the next thing you know, he's back drinking again and drinking really hard. He's a Christian and he's doing things that he knows he shouldn't do, but he's doing them anyway because he has this compulsion and it's, it's a deep root. It goes all the way back to his childhood and some anger that he has against his dad. Maybe that's your story. Maybe there's some things in your life that are triggers for you. And when you get triggered, you find yourself in a compulsion where you're, you're repeating bad behavior that you know. You know it's bad. You know you, God doesn't want you to do that. You know, just as he knew, it was su suicide slowly. You know these things. I've got some great news for you. Jesus can set you free from that. It's the same thing that you just saw. You have to forgive. You have to set them free. Whoever harmed you, whoever said a bad word to you, whoever did anything against you, you need to let them go because you're holding that, and it's, it's literally inviting poison into your soul, and it's triggering you into all these behaviors. The good news is Jesus can help you forgive. He's not waiting. He's saying, I'm right here. I can, I can show you the way. If you want this, ask for it. All you have to do is say, I'm holding on to these things. Jesus, can you help me get through it? If you need someone to walk you through this process, we're here for you because it is a process. Just identify who you need to forgive Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, and we'll pray you through to victory. You can have it today. Here's a word from the Gospel of John. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. God bless you.